All right, good evening. I'd like to call to order uh, the March 10th Joint Policy and Planning Commission with the Environmental Board at 6.32. Uh, due to the virtual format of today's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some basic guidelines. We have participants attending by computer and others who may be attending by phone. For all meeting attendees who wish to speak, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And if you have technical issues, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet, or use the call in information in the meeting invite to call into the meeting. And now we're going to move on to attendance. Uh, Stephen, will you go ahead and please uh, take the role for Policy and Planning Commission? And Stacy, please do the same for environment, Environmental Board following. Yes. One second while I pull up my list. Okay, Commissioner Lewis. Here. Commissioner Monahan. Here. Commissioner Voice. Here. Commissioner Fowl. Here. Commissioner Bader. Here. And Commissioner Milligan has an excused absence. And uh, Commissioner Zaragoza. Here. Everybody but Commissioner Milligan is in attendance tonight, Chair. Great. And for the Environmental Board, uh, Danny Maiden, Don McWilliams. Here. Rishi Hazra uh, has a, a excused absence. Cameron Fisher. Yeah. Laura Labeco. Nancy Davidson. Here. Dan Hintz. Ann Newcomb. Here. Jamie Finch. Here. Tom Anderson. Here. Surya Bola Pragada. And Janet Wall. Here. That Thank is you, it Stacey. for the Environmental Board. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to open this up to uh, public comment first, but I'd like to go over the structure of the meeting. Uh, first, we'll have uh, public speaking on general topics, and then we'll go into the meeting to, uh, broken out into four topics, uh, geological, uh, geologically hazardous areas, wetlands, fish and wildlife habitat, and critical aquifer recharge areas. Uh, we will then break off as we cover each topic, we will have a opportunity to be able to ask questions. And we'll open it up for public comment again. And during each topic, we will PPC will turn off their cameras and not deliberate. This will be an opportunity for the environmental board to actually have a deliberative conversation about these topics. Okay, and with that said, uh, let's go ahead and, and open up for general public comment. Uh, Kristen, do we have any members from the public who would like to speak generally? I'm going to pass this one over to Stephen. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, tonight I'll be facilitating tonight's meeting, so I'll be helping with public comment. Uh, no one had let us know uh, ahead of time that they want to do public comment. Um, so anybody that's able to send a chat, send a chat to me to let me know. I see Kyler Davidson Danielson would like to uh, do public comment, so I'm going to move you to a panelist. And I am going to unmute you. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Kyler Danielson. I'm the land use project manager for Lakeside Industries. Um, I'm commenting today particularly about the critical aquifer recharge area, the map designation for Lakeside's property, and the list of prohibited activities in the CARA 2, which is um, what Lakeside's property has been designated as. Um, we have some concerns that the map designations um, coincide directly with the property lines, which doesn't 
um, seem to make sense for how the aquifers would actually function underground. Um, we haven't seen any data to support it, and so we would appreciate if that information could be put online and be available to the public. Um, we believe that the um, the changes are inconsistent with the zoning code and the development agreement that Lakeside has um, signed and agreed to with the city of Issaquah in 2013. Um, and that agreement recognized our continued existence at our site. Um, by making our site a non-conforming use, it actually makes it much more difficult for us to make changes to our plant to make it better for the environment. And so we wanna be able to continue to make those modifications and improvements um, with the future in mind. So I did submit a letter, so I'd appreciate if you could read it. And we're happy to work with um, the staff and anyone that's willing to talk to us about this issue. Okay, if there's anyone else, uh, please raise your hand for public comment. I have one call in user I'm gonna check with just in case they don't know how to uh, raise their hand from the phone. Uh, for the call in user, um, are you gonna be speaking for public comment tonight? Uh, this is uh, Hank Haynes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Hendrick W. It is Hank Haynes, H-A-Y-N-E-S. I put in a lengthy uh, comment uh, in, a, in advance, uh, which should be uh, in your file along with a, a linkage to a video in case you want to see it. Uh, I'm real concerned about uh, some very sensitive areas that we have going along SR 169, uh, the Cedar River, along Cedar Grove Road. Uh, and also along uh, Issaquah Creek, and my presentation uh, covers that. It also concerns uh, the, the coal mine areas, the, uh, uh, the areas that we have in terms of slide zones, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and also uh, potential use of those coal mines, those coal mine areas for uh, underground uh, vertical farming uh, and also uh, avenues for, for uh, future thoroughfares for, for passing um, uh, roads and also uh, public uh, transit. So that would be a fairly long discussion that feeds directly into the very important work that, that you're doing now. And I hope you will look at uh, my presentation as well as the ones from Lakeside Industries. I very much appreciate their position too. So with that uh, arrest, I want to thank you very much for your comment. I leave uh, for this opportunity. I live here uh, on uh, the Cedar uh, River uh, on the Canyon Rim. And I look across the canyon uh, right at the Cedar Hills Regional Landfill, uh, this area called uh, Queen City Farm and Lakeside Industries is going to be, uh, if I'm thinking of the right party, uh, they're going to be putting the asphalt plant uh, right below my house. So uh, we're all fun neighbors. Uh, so have a good day, sir. I, I really got to enjoy this uh, uh, meeting. So thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Hank. So now I'm gonna go to Susan and then I'll go to Connie Marsh next. Susan, I'm gonna make you a panelist. Hello, this is Susan Nabil, and I'm trying to start my video. Um, I'm having a hard time, so I'll try later. Okay, <laughs> um, we can hear you. I have a general question regarding the Title A changes that I wanted to share right now. I've been um, working on this for a number of days, and first of all, thank you all for being here and allowing us to have this opportunity. And um, I've already sent in various questions and gotten some good answers. And I, as an overall um, observation, I would like to make this comment because a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I'm still having issues understanding how the proposed changes are going to work and if the new code changes are what we discussed in during all the numerous meetings. And I was wondering if the developmental or the planning committee, or geez, excuse me, the planning administration would consider um, 
maybe taking an, an existing development and compare the old code and the new code and what it looks like now and what it could look like based on the changes proposed or even an old application that, that never got uh, developed, just so that we could see um, visually the changes. And I am referring back to a meeting this summer when the various committees went out and looked at uh, different developments. And it really uh, opened up our eyes to understanding the process. So I just was wondering if the planning department could consider that. And if they do consider it, if it's something we could discuss and look over before the first draft goes to city council. Um, and that's it for now. And the other areas, I'll come in later. Thank you. Great, thank you, Susan. I'm gonna move you back to the new list. One second. Okay, Connie, I have unmuted you. We can go ahead. Okay, and could you um, could you able my video because my video is disabled? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, you're over. We we can't. Oh, there you are. Yes, you can see me now. It just takes a little while. So my name is Connie Marsh, and um, I have put a lot of time into this. Now we're getting to the point, and I I know how this goes because this is not the first time we've done code review, and that is the point where the city staff feels like they've been working on it for a really long time and they think it's good and um, they want to move on. And so uh, unfortunately that's usually just when people are getting their first look at it. And so the first thing I want to say is, remember, this is not on a timeline. Both council and the mayor have not put this on a timeline to make sure that there is ample time to review. So you don't have to be rushed. You don't have to put something forth uh, that then they're going to fix later. After you've adopted it, we can always come back once a year and change it and fine tune it. Um, that happened to the central Issaquah plan three years later. We had to go back and do a rework with a moratorium on growth and it was sort of ugly. So now the draft is out. People are going to submit comments. And I guess what I was hoping to hear is something from city staff that was more general. How are the comments that are being put in place tonight then going to be used? Are these comments going to be incorporated into the draft that goes to council? Is council getting the same draft that that we all are seeing? Um, when can we expect to see changes and know that they're happening? And as a euphemism, I use the term, what's the feedback loop on this? And so we can track it to see if we need to continue on asking for topic changes, or not, but I, I would actually like to know all that before we go into the little breakout things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. I'll move you back over to the attendees. And Susan, I see your hand is raised. Oh, this must be from your previous public comment. I don't see any other public comments tonight, Chair Fall. All right, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. So uh, I do, uh, to the presenters tonight, I would like to address uh, Connie's question about the feedback loop, if they could speak to that uh, at the appropriate time in their presentations, that would be great. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to, uh, the first person is going to be Jim with his presentation tonight. So Jim, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Fall. Um, you know, I'll go ahead and if you want to, uh, me to address those questions before um, I can speak to that. And Jim's going to talk about the geotechnic, you know, geologically hazardous areas. Perfect. So, in, ter in terms of um, the process moving forward, uh, we this is the first time, um, you know, we've uh, we're 
soliciting formal written comments uh, and you all are looking at it and getting the public hearing on this. I mean, we've had conversations, we've had discussions at the policy level, and then we've created the draft. So by no means is this the only opportunity to uh, provide comments or um, um, or not. So uh, mo the next steps for this are you all, you know, we're taking public comments now. You all will deliberate on March 24th. At that time, we, you can uh, create a list of things that needs additional work. Uh, or the 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 elements that need um, that you agree with and and are good, or the other ones that um, you don't agree with, you can kind of give us some feedback on that. If there are items that need additional work, we'll create a list of those. We'll share that with uh, City Council. Ask them if there's an additional things that they want um, the boards and commissions to consider, and then we'll go back to work on. Uh, really actually addressing some of these comments that have come in and we'll track them in a matrix similar to the one that you have in your packet today. So the public comments that you have in your packet today were prior to creating the first draft. So everything we heard from public prior to actually creating the, the draft is uh, and our responses are included in your packet. After the draft has been released, we, we're going to take all the comments, create a similar matrix and and address the comments for your consideration. There is, uh, we can, um, you know, currently um, the next public hearing on this type, uh, item is scheduled for um, summer um, with the consolidated draft. So we have un from now until then to kind of keep working on those things. We can have another check in if that's something that would be helpful for everyone. So uh, this is by no means the only time that we're going to, you know, we're going to move on to the other things. Yes, obviously we want to hear as many possible public comments now so we can adequately address them. So I hope that answers uh, one of the questions. The other question I think was from Susan in terms of can we use an example and that came up during uh, the open house. Um, in our presentations today, we uh, try and um, use that uh, strategy to kind of uh, help illustrate by some examples and with some graphics. So we're happy to to take that a step further and, and analyze an actual project and, and share with um, you on the 24th. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Jim to uh, carry on. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, uh, committee members and uh, public who are attending tonight. Thank you. Can you everybody see my screen? And hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you and we see your screen. Thanks, Jim. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm here to speak about geological hazardous areas. And uh, these areas are grouped in the following uh, five categories that are listed below. Coal mines, erosion, landslide, seismic hazard areas, and steep slope hazard areas. Uh, the codes have been, uh, we've endeavored at least to update the codes uh, to look and reflect uh, best available science and to bring a focus on uh, providing public safety and protection of property uh, from hazards, geo geologic hazards. So I'm going to discuss a summary of some of the code changes. So assessing critical areas is sort of the first step in the process of uh, the um, of, of mitigating or assessing the critical areas. So we spend a fair amount of time looking at the critical area study requirements. And in many of the code sections, such as landslides, coal mine hazards, and seismic, we've updated the requirements for the study. The old code had some, some very general study requirements for critical area studies. Uh, we've aug augmented that in the new code with some specific requirements for some of the other critical areas. 
the uh, peer review requirements for critical areas reports is also in, vitally important. Uh, it's the job of the peer reviewer to provide a check on the completeness and also the compliance with the standard of practice uh, for uh, assessing the critical areas. In the various sections of the critical areas code, there are requirements that the critical areas reports uh, have a peer review conducted and that peer review has to be uh, completed and accepted uh, for the critical areas report to be uh, finalized. Uh, defining the roles for the professionals uh, involved in preparing critical areas reports uh, is important. Uh, what we want to see is the professionals who have the experience uh, necessary working on the types of uh, geologic critical areas that they have the expertise for. In other words, we would like to see geotechnical engineers who have some experience in uh, coal mines and coal mine hazard mitigation working on those types of critical areas. Having engineering geologists weigh in and work on reports that have to do with landslides and steep slopes and geotechnical engineers uh, working in areas where they have their expertise as well. So there's some uh, defining the roles and the definitions and also the requirements for who has to stamp uh, these uh, reports as licensed professionals. Uh, most of the landslides that occur or that have occurred in Issaquah uh, have actually occurred on slopes that are less steep than 40%. Uh, so I think we wanted to make a lot or we wanted to increase the emphasis in the code on identification of landslide hazards. And not that 40% or steeper slopes are not important, but it's, all, it's equally important to identify landslides that might exist on less steep slopes. So we've included some criteria for identification of landslides and requirements to check uh, with different mapping agencies uh, who do a lot of work in identifying where landslides exist. So coal mine hazards, in the old code, there was no definition of coal mine hazard zones. There'll be a slide a little bit later where I'll, I will talk a bit more in detail about this, but the new code identifies the, the hazard zones uh, and uh, provides uh, mitigation responsibilities for the different types of hazard zones uh, listed in the code. Uh, I'm going to show a slide in a little bit about hazard buffers. So we put together a table which discusses um, or lists all of the buffers and that are associated with the geologic hazards to provide a nice summary uh, so you don't have to hunt through the code to find all of that. The buffer reductions is a, is a pretty important topic. Uh, there are standard buffers for different um, geologic hazards, and there are cases where buffers uh, reductions may be appropriate. I'll discuss that in a little bit as well. And finally, uh, seismic hazard areas. Um, we provide some more details on how you define a seismic hazard area, and then also what mitigation standards will be uh, required if you're building in one of those seismic hazard areas. So we also looked at some changes in how they might actually add some protection to geologic hazard areas. A, a buffer was added in the, in the code for severe coal mine hazard areas. Previously, there weren't any buffer requirements. I'll talk a bit about the um, allowances for increasing buffers for landslides and steep slopes. Um, I think that is that potential has always been in the code, uh, but there may be some uh, specific cases where 
there'll be more attention brought to the potential for increasing buffers uh, related to uh, landslides or steep slopes, the way the code is written now. And landslide hazards, it's we've made it clear that all landslides require buffers uh, unless the landslide risk can be uh, mitigated or eliminated uh, for, uh, forever into the future. So this is a table that we're going to put in the code. I know those of you who spent a lot of time reading the draft code already did not see this table. Uh, it, it will be added, so you're probably seeing it for the first time. It lists on the left-hand side four types, or actually all five of the uh, geologically hazardous areas, and then whether those areas require buffers or not, and then whether those buffers would also require an additive building setback, sometimes called a BSBL, building setback line. And then there's a classification column, column with the standard buffers, and then the minimum buffer that would be allowed in the case of a buffer reduction. At the very bottom, you'll see under severe coal mine hazards, there's a 15 foot buffer. Previously, there were no buffers for coal mine hazards. So I wanna talk a little bit about the buffers for steep slopes. This equally applies to landslide hazards. The buffers are applied, well, to the top and toe and actually the sides of it. This is a cross section. So I'm gonna talk about the top and the toe. So the standard buffer is 50 feet from the crest or the toe of a 40% or greater slope or if it's a landslide, it could be gentler uh, slope. The building setback is also shown here as a red line, and the building setback is additive to the buffer. The criteria for uh, a steep slope critical area is that the slope height uh, must be 20 feet uh, or greater. So an exemption can be made for slopes that are less than 20 feet high. So you could imagine if you had a slope that was say only 22 or 23 feet, so it just met the criteria. If the slope was only that high, I think you would probably agree that having a buffer of 50 feet from the top and toe of that slope from a, a safety standpoint might be a bit excessive. It's almost two times the slope height. Um, so I think the, the code is written so that a buffer reduction for something like that might be reasonable. On the converse, you could imagine if this slope height was 200 feet high. Uh, in that case, a buffer of 50 feet may not actually be enough. And so the having flexibility in the buffer width uh, depending on the nature and the height of the slope is important to have in the code. This final slide is uh, regarding coal mine hazards. All of the coal mine, uh, or all of the coal seams within the city of Issaquah are sloping or dipping. So this, uh, this figure depicts a dipping coal seam under the ground surface. And not usually not all of the coal seam is mined, so you have coal pillars left in place. And the mined out sections of the coal seam usually collapse with time. The code is written in such a way that really deep coal seams, like on the left side of the figure here, that are 300 feet or, or deeper beneath the ground surface would be considered declassified or could be considered declassified uh, upon submittal and approval of a critical areas report. Uh, coal seams that are between 300 and, and 150 feet deep would be classified as moderate hazard. 
that would probably be in the range here, kind of in the middle, where you could have collapse. It doesn't reach the surface, but it could cause some subsidence at the surface called trough subsidence. And the code has criteria for evaluating uh, the amount of acceptable trough subsidence. And then on the far right here, where you have the potential for a collapse to reach the ground surface and cause a sinkhole, those are considered severe hazard areas. And those hazard areas, when they are defined, will require a buffer. And the purpose of the buffer around the edge of the severe hazard area is twofold. One, because the actual edge of the hazard area is difficult to, to pinpoint, and it could be a little bit bigger. And then two, if there is ever a collapse, then you would want access uh, for equipment or other things to get in there and mitigate the surface opening. That uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Jim. So we're going to go ahead and open it up for commissioner uh, questions. If you have a question, please go ahead and enter it into the chat window. Okay, and the first question is Jamie Finch. So Commissioner Finch, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Paul. Jamie Finch from the Environmental Board speaking. Um, thanks for the presentation, Jim. I had a question um, about when landslide and critical area studies are required. I'm just curious, are there instances where the type of development that is occurring has the potential to change whether that slope has a landslide risk? And if so, how is that contemplated in the code? So development applications are required for, you know, a, a, or I should say critical area studies would be required for a development application that has a critical area on it or a critical area is suspected on it. Uh, that is determined, uh, I think Emily can address that at the time of the application. Uh, and the various critical areas would be identified and then the critical areas would be study would be required for those types of critical areas. Um, and then during the peer review of that critical area study, there would be a check to see whether or not all of the critic, the appropriate critical areas have been addressed. So there's a, a second check uh, to make sure that um, everything is that might be present on the site or being addressed. Yeah, oh, I think Emily might be on mute. All right, and thank you much, uh, Commissioner Finch. And next. Uh, oh, no, I think Emily was responding. That's why I was saying. Yeah, pardon me. I, I was just oh. going to add a little bit to that, and it may help clarify. Typically, when an application is submitted, we verify with our maps if there's critical areas uh, that might be impacted by the application. And if there are, then we request that there's a, a geologic study that's submitted with the application so they can assess the impact there and then it progresses forward with the peer review once we, we get that study. Yeah, I guess my question was a little bit different. I, I think I was like, let's take Jim's diagram where there's a house at the top. If that instead of a house, there is a, a million square foot parking lot that funnels all the water to the bottom of it, it, would that be treated any differently in the terms of the buffers and how that might where that could sit relative to an unstable slope like that that's maybe a better way of framing up my question i see yeah well a parking lot you know jim maybe you can help me out here i'm not sure yeah. if the building setbacks apply necessarily well this this the buffer would apply and uh the parking lot i'm not quite sure about the bsbl for the parking lot but there would certainly be a buffer requirement at the, the crest, regardless of whether um, whatever the structure is. The purpose of the buffer is to remain in its natural state. 
Um, and then there would be reviews about any discharge of water to the crest of slopes. Uh, that would certainly be reviewed because water is a known contributor to slope instability. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Commissioner Finch. And uh, the next commissioner is uh, Commissioner uh, Nancy Davidson from the Environmental Board. You have the floor. Thank you very much. So, in one section of the code, of the new code on page eight, it says steep slopes may be used for approved surface water conveyance in accordance with the city's adopted surface water regulations. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I guess I'm concerned that, you know, Jim, you just said we surface water is a problem for a steep slope, which I think is pretty well acknowledged, but we can allow surface water to be conveyed across a steep slope. You know, um, isn't that kind of a conflict of interest and why would we be allowing that to happen? I, I think that is intended to uh, conveyance would be in a pipe. So it's an exemption for like a utility type of, of um, occurrence. So if we needed to convey surface water and it had to go across a steep slope, it could be conveyed in a pipe. If it was to be you know, dispersed or you know, come out of the pipe somehow, that would be something that we would you know, review and probably not allow on a steep slope because that wouldn't make any sense. So don't you think that needs to be clarified so that applicants who are trying to build or construct around a steep slope kind of has a better idea of what they're doing and to protect that slope? Just a comment. I shouldn't be yeah, making comments sure. yet. Sorry about that. <laughs> my apologies. See, the, my understanding of that, I think it's in the exemptions, was for uh, city agencies uh, to be allowed to have that as an exemption, not an applicant uh, for a site development. For, for conveyance. And maybe that needs to be uh, clarified to take a look at that. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that, um, Nancy. It, it doesn't say city, so we'll look at the language and the, you know, what's the, the intent. But I think it is not meant for surface water dispersion or anything. It's more for, um, you know, the keeping the safety in mind. So we can, we can research that and right. clarify the language. Yeah. And my comment is surface water can be conveyed in a um, ditch, a canal, it not necessarily in a pipe. So I think that kind of clarification is important along the way. Um, the second comment I'd make is, Jim, I could not find in, I'll admit, I read these, but I didn't read every line, line for line. So there's my first admission. But I didn't find where it said that it had to be prepared by someone that had a specialty in that area, such as steep slopes or seismic or whatever the case, or landslides. And if it's in there, great. Just That's just a general question. I'm not sure if you've looked at that, but I couldn't find it. So it's something to keep in mind. And then I guess the last question I have for you is in reviewing the landslide ha hazard areas and the ability to um, change the amount of buffer that's required, how do you, what is the criteria for that? So I don't really see any criteria for that in this and any way that, you know, you that the public can understand how that decision was made. And so I guess I'm wondering, is that something that is left up to scientists to figure out or is there gonna be criteria showing up at some point? So the intent is to have the applicants um, geotechnical engineers and other scientists provide analysis of the slopes um, with buffer reductions uh, being proposed. That analysis includes slope stability analysis. So they will have to be able to demonstrate that the stability of the slope does not decrease from the, uh, the 50 foot buffer compared to the reduced buffer. And the requirements are to provide analytical slope stability analysis at uh, any place, you know, selected cross sections at any place where they provide a or recommend a buffer reduction. So there is an analytical and uh, geotechnical process 
to be able to show that. And they must show it with uh, adequate factors of safety for both seismic and, uh, and uh, static. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Davidson. So, sorry about the sneezing on the microphone. I tried to hit mute, but I couldn't actually get it to fast enough. So uh, allergies are great. Uh, okay, the next commissioner here is Tom Anderson. You have a uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Tom Anderson, the Environmental Board here. Um, in the spirit of the comment we heard from the public earlier about using examples, I'm wondering if we'd go back to the slide where you had the table of uh, setbacks and all for various hazards that had that lovely picture of the slide on Newport Way and talk about that Newport Way slide as an example and how we might have uh, address that, or is that is that unfair to uh, take a specific uh, example like that? So, um, yeah, not that one. This one, this one. That slide there on the right, uh, that's, uh, I believe, that's the recent one that occurred just this last season. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, is it, uh, is that fair to talk about? Jim, I'm not sure if you have much to say to say about this one, this is a, a site that's in King County that slid onto the city's road. And I'm not sure if there's any development up there um, that would have happened, but I know that Jim can probably talk about how the code would apply to any remediation that, that needed to be done. Well, for example, at the foot, uh, okay, there's a road right there at the base of the slide. So maybe during the process of uh, designing and constructing that road, uh, these factors uh, uh, would have been considered and uh, stabilization of that soap would have been required or something like that. That's um, uh, what I'm guessing, but uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, Emily's correct. Um, so the, the property on adjacent to the road is King County and the road is is uh, city of Issaquah. Um, so cross jurisdictional things can be quite challenging. Um, if you were constructing a new road here today, uh, you would have to first identify the critical areas that would be adjacent to the roadway. So in this case, you would have both steep slopes and likely landslide hazards. So in order to design this roadway you would have to assess the stability of these steep slopes you would have to do a critical area study and you would have to demonstrate that the slopes would be stable at the the inclinations that you're going to be cutting them to to install the roadway if they are not you would have to uh, install retaining walls or some other type of structural uh, fix or regrade the slopes uh, in such a way as to make them stable. If they are uh, steep slopes under the, with the uh, greater than 40%, you're not allowed to regrade those in the city. You're not allowed to, uh, to alter them. If it is a landslide, a, a geologic landslide, uh, you are allowed to mitigate that and make it stable uh, for your roadway. As far as mitigating this right now, uh, there will be a structural fix put in place here that will stabilize this landslide and also provide catchment for uh, other materials that might slide beyond the area that they stable and uh, that they stabilize and keep uh, the material off the roadway in the future. That answer your question. Uh, yes, thank you. That was that was an interesting example. Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. An uh, Commissioner Anderson and Commissioner Voice. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fell. Looking at this actual, what well, we have this slide, is there a, so two questions, but is there a reason why we have so many not availables as far as uh, standard buffer or minimum buffer allowed? I'm sorry, could you re repeat the question? So looking okay. at this slide right here, Mr. Yeah. Johnson, is there a reason why on some of these, I believe, kind of looking at uh, seismic, not, not available, is that just because that entire thing is site specific? 
Oh, good question. Um, so for liquefaction, um, there's no buffer for that because, you, well, you cannot effectively buffer against it. The only way to mitigate liquefaction is to design for it because it is going to happen. Uh, so if you were to buffer for liquefaction, you would be evacuating or buffering all of downtown on the valley floor or much of it in any case, because much of it's liquefiable. So it is not a discrete zone or area that you could buffer from. Okay, well, thank you. And then the other question I have is I remember reading this draft code and I believe it, the wording was civic engineer um, as far as the, as far as talking about experts. And then you had mentioned possibly passing this off to someone who is more knowledgeable about Pacific Northwest, whether it be mines or different geological areas. Uh, my question is, do we have any type of data about their availability and are we possibly creating a backlog by looking for more experts that are more in tune with these specific hazards? You're, you're speaking to having peer review experts available to uh, do the peer reviews on these different uh, applications. Yeah, they're, they're, the consulting community has quite a number of experts um, in the specific things that are listed here, landslide, seismic. I would say that coal mine probably has the fewer number of experts, but there are at least three or four that come to mind. So I don't think there'd be a backlog and there's not a particular the large amount of applications that come in on a given year for that deal with coal mine hazards. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Voice. And we have a question here from Commissioner Newcomb. You have the floor. And Newcomb here from the Environmental Board. I'm just curious um, do landowners or does anybody ever? Fill these old coal mines to create more stab stability. Um, I'm so there. There has been a proposal to mitigate a a high hazard or severe hazard lands or coal mine uh, area um, or a coal mine hazard. Uh, it's very unusual because it's quite costly to do. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to excavate down to the uh, the, the old um, access tunnel that has a bunch of loose ground and voids in it, and they're going to open it up to the ground surface, and then they're going to fill it in, effectively eliminating the hazard, and then they're they will have no uh, severe hazard there anymore. It's very uncommon. Um, this is the first time I've seen it uh, done in Issaquah. So, uh, but it can be done, and uh, it's an effective way to uh, eliminate a severe hazard. And these are usually features that are very close to the ground surface, within about 20, 25 feet from the ground surface. Interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, Commissioner Newcomb. And I'm not seeing any additional questions. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and open it up to public comment on the geological hazards. Um, so Stephen, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak tonight about this specific topic? Yes, uh, Kyler Danielson would like to speak on this topic. Uh, Kyler, I'm unmuting you now and making you a panelist. And excuse me, I'm gonna, Sorry. I'm gonna jump in really quickly before we go. Um, oh, yes. Ron, I wanna remind you, this is actually a public hearing night, so we need to open it at a certain time. And when public comments are closed, are done at the very end of all of the presentations, then they need to be closed at that specific time as well. So opened at about 721. Okay, thank you. And I also need to make, uh, make a mention that uh, we need to keep public comments to uh, less than five minutes tonight. I don't think that'll be a problem for me. Um, sorry to comment again, but um, I wanted to comment on the issue of this peer review for um, this topic. And there was one comment in here about the difficulty in finding experts. 
for um, this effort. And I will say from personal experience, it can be a real challenge to find experts that can speak particularly on steep slopes. Um, and the expert report expense can be already extremely high in some cases. And experts are just that, they're experts in their field. Steep slopes have been researched for decades and the experts evaluate the geological and hydro hydrological conditions at the time of permitting and they're completely qualified to make those assessments. I've never seen a peer review requirement in any of the counties or cities that Lakeside Industries operates. Um, peer review is typically something that's used when you have a report that's going to be published and widely relied on rather than a site-by-site -site assessment. Um, and based on the information and the knowledge and background of the experts that are available, they should be completely qualified to do this work without a peer review. So I would actually recommend that that requirement be removed. Um, and that's my comment for now. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. So I also see Connie Marsh and Susan Neville. Um, give me one second to move Kyler. All right, Connie, I moved you to panelist. It's starting my video here. Um, so, uh, having watched our geologic struggle for many years, as we have a significant number of landslides, um, we started in Issaquah a best management practice of peer review and even double peer reviews for our steep slopes because we have had so many issues with sliding slopes including water towers, palace, um, developable areas, with goody corner. We have, we have a, a very large number of landslide situations. So um, even with our, our double suspender peer reviews, we have a hard time not having landslides. Um, it's complicated. And you can't poke enough holes in the ground to actually understand 10 feet by 10 feet what is happening in each geologic area. Uh, now, just a really quick, we have both upheaval from, from our earthquake faults and we have our glacial formations, which creates a geologic underpinning that's crazy. And so it is more difficult in Issaquah than most pla many places to understand what's going on underground, even with LIDAR, which is this pinging stuff where they try to look and see what's underground. Um, so I'm for the peer review, and I don't even trust that amount of peer review from the results that I have seen. So the criteria that are used in those reports need in my opinion, to be even more stringent. Now, the next question that I have has to do with when we allow for access roads cutting across steep slopes, which then require variances. And, and seems how we haven't gotten to the variance chapter, but I don't entirely understand what kind of critical area studies are going to be needed in addition because we often have to allow access to properties and that often means cutting across uh, vulnerable steep slopes and landslide hazard areas. So um, I'm not sure where the proper place is to address these things that are gonna be allowed, have to be allowed on steep slopes and what they should contain. But if you would just put that into your, to your hopper that would be great, thank you. Thank you, Connie. I'm gonna move you back over to the attendee list. And I see Susan, you have your hand raised, so I'm gonna mute you now and move, move you to a panelist. Uh, hello. Um, I had a question regarding the criteria for changing buffers 
And I understand that's with after the analysis and the peer groups, it, is this where the director will make the final approval? Um, once all this information is gathered, because that was what I was reading under the uh, the the um, tables. So when there's a reduction, the final decision is made by the director. And then my other question or uh, is concerning um, protections for land for um, steep slopes. There were two added protections added, and one was um, existing native vegetation is protected within the buffer as long as it's maintained. And the other one was um, for steep slope hazards is prohibited with exceptions for hazardous trees or noxious weeds. And I think what happens when a development starts to happen, trees are uprooted, which causes other trees to lose their stability. So not only are you move, removing a certain number of trees, usually what's happened in the past, um, many more have to be removed because of that. And I'm not sure if there's any way you can protect that type of development from happening. And then my third one was, are there no protections for homeowners if slide occurs within a development as we're seeing in other uh, counties and that's happening today? And this is still question and answer period, I think. And, and I was wondering if that included BPC, if they're asking questions during this period. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I also see uh, Mary Lynch, you have your hand up, so I'm gonna mute you and make you a panelist now. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, Mary, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna just piggyback on what Connie was saying about peer reviews is, just even in recent years, we've had um, this issues where the city internally has peer reviewed uh, issues and after the fact have found that there has been problems with those and not thorough per peer reviews or, you know, thorough studies. So I really um, would like to see that the peer review stays in there and would like to see an outside not just a, you know, necessarily a city uh, peer review and make sure that they are qualified to give that. And someone that is knowledgeable of the area, as Connie was saying, Issaquah and our slopes are, are a little bit different. And I'm glad you talked about the slide that was um, happened on Newport Way, because we as a public stood out at the development meetings and expressed our concerns about that road and the road actually was changed and the city staff did approve for the wall to be cut in and for just the very low level of blocks to be done and not a complete study of the hill because they said oh nothing's going to happen and the problem that the city got into as the comment was made well that's county property so when this after it was cut into and the short wall built there, not, you know, less than, you know, six months, uh, the slide happened. And then the problem is, is whose fault is it? And we on this part of town had to put up with that. And um, you are still are living with it, that I live west of, uh, of the slide. And so our access into Issaquah is bad. There are a lot of places where Issaquah touches the county area. So it may be a gray area, but this is something we need in our codes to identify. Again, that is a characteristic of our city, and we need to make sure our codes clearly state how we are to handle those and how we are to handle when a slide happens, who's responsible and how it's going to um, help so that some of us are not, you know, landlocked for and inconvenienced while the city tries to decide is it the city issue or is it um, the county issue and how are you going to prevent it from happening in the future? Thank you. 
and my name is Mary Lynch. I don't think I said that. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Chair Paul, I don't see any other raised hands for public comment. Okay, and thank you, uh, uh, Stephen. So I'm going to go ahead and close public comment at 7:32, and now we will go ahead and turn this over to Nancy to deliberate on this topic. Uh, so, question for Nancy first is: Do you want your commissioners to um, deliberate on the four separated uh, topics, or do you want to deliberate once all the presentations are completed? I think it will be easier to do each the four topics, particularly after the public comments. So that would be my preference if that's acceptable to the chair. That's acceptable. I was just asking for clarification to see what how you wanted to handle that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to you and uh, PPC, please turn off your cameras and we will let uh, Nancy take care of the uh, environmental board. Thank you. And at this point, I think we're open to comments on the uh, geologic areas. So. There are any comments from the environmental board members? Okay, I see uh, Don McWilliams, please go ahead. Thanks, Nancy. So Don McWilliams, environmental board. So my comment goes back to Nancy's uh, question about the parking lots and the conversation there. And it, it spurred a, uh, a question for me of how does the this code compare with the requirements of the stormwater standards. Um, your current stormwater standards are going to tell you that you have to disperse first or you have to put it off into the hillside as your your first choice. But this seems to be contradictory to that. So just caution to staff to be on alert for that. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, next comment is from Jamie Finch. Please go ahead, Jamie. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie Finch, Environmental Board. Um, my one comment was I appreciate with the coal mine having kind of clear, well, relatively clear standards on declassified, moderate, severe. I just wonder, and this is kind of dovetailing off of Nancy's earlier comment around criteria for steep slope and landslides. I mean, I'm I'm used to looking at like avalanche forecasting with skier and like likelihood and severity or or size is 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 going to be something that I would assume in a study could be defined. And so I don't know if there's a common language that can be used. It just seems like we haven't really put um, any clear guidelines. And that I would think would be a key outcome from a critical area study of, of a landslide area or a steep slope. So I'd, that just seems like an area that if, if there's more that can be done to firm up and clarify where, um, what what types of, of uh, threats would be present in a given property and how that might relate to the buffer. I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, next, we have Cameron Fisher. Go ahead, Cameron. Thank you, Nancy. Cameron Fisher, Environmental Board. Um, I would just like to reiterate the uh, the conversations we've been hearing uh, regarding the peer review. Um, I think that uh, should be maintained or included. Uh, this is uh, a very specialized um, um, expertise uh, and and I would like to see uh, the city encourage the uh, development um, to uh, to keep the uh, going and uh, maintain the, the, that uh, that the effort thank you thank you Cameron uh, Tom Anderson please go ahead uh, Tom Anderson here Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, so let's see, my, my comment was uh, about uh, the lakeside input uh, there on uh, well, some of the points made there were included comments about how uh, the city's changes weren't based on best available science, you know, well, just strong words. And and how do we how do we get resolution to something like that? I mean, it's not for us as the environmental board, uh, not scientists to uh, ascertain, uh, well, are they or are they not? Um, I'm, I'm a little bit in a quandary about how resolution on those kinds of things uh, can be uh, accomplished. The city, I think, would have to um, uh, meet that uh, head on and, and figure out, well, is that the case or not? And uh, get resolution to it. Um, so I'm I'm a little uncertain um, uh, how we 
can disposition those kinds of concerns because it's not our role to decide whether or not they are or are not uh, based on best uh, science available. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And Janet, we don't have a full environmental board. If you have any comments, please feel free on any of these topics as we get to them to weigh in. And if you have anything tonight on this topic, I'd appreciate your feedback. Janet Wall. Thank you. No, I don't uh, have any uh, comments beyond what has already been discussed. Okay, uh, and I'm going to provide my comments as the chair or just as myself. I am concerned specifically about the reduction in buffer sizes. Uh, 50 feet of buffer is not a lot to be asking on a steep slope or a landslide ha hazard area. And um, it a lot can happen in that 50 feet. And we've seen the consequences of earth movements in the community. And I would encourage you, when you take a buffer from 50 feet down to 10 feet, you are really significantly reducing that buffer. And um, it troubles me that we're considering that and leaving that as an option in the code because to take it all the way to 10 instead of to 25, reduce it in half, seems like a more reasonable expectation because if the area slides or there's something happens, the responsibility then lies with the city to pay for it and to deal with it. So I am troubled by that, though I know we're having peer reviews and I would encourage us to continue to do that. But I would ask staff to really consider um, thinking long and hard about the criteria for reductions and the significance of those reductions and the long-term consequences to the city over the next 100 years. So um, I think there's some pretty significant reductions that are being allowed in the code. And um, I think it will be pushed very hard on staff to make those reductions. And we've seen it happen in the city before, and that troubles me. Any other comments from the environmental board? Okay, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Ron to uh, begin the meeting again. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you very much, Nancy. And so the next uh, presentation is, let's see, Jim, are you doing that presentation or? No, I'm not doing the next one. City okay. staff Doug Yormick will be uh, doing the next presentation. Oh, very good. Okay, so you have the floor. All right, thank you. Um, I'm trying to get everything set up here. Okay, can everybody see the slide? Yes, and we can hear you. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am going to be presenting the, um, the four topics listed here in the natural environment bucket, wetlands, streams, fish and wildlife habitat, conservation areas, and critical aquifer recharge areas. Um, after each section, I will um, pause for comment and deliberation and then continue on once that section has been completed. So the update to the wetland section is the current code is 1810-597 through 760. Um, the goals in making these changes, these were provided by council, the comp plan, the strategic plan, or represent best available science. Um, and with the wetland changes, the, the highlight the two major changes, which is eliminating the 25% buffer reduction for wetlands, and then incorporating the 2014 ecology wetland guidance. So wetlands are rated using the 2014 wetland rating form for Western Washington. They're scored on three criteria, hydrology, where the water comes from, habitat, the surrounding area, and water quality functions or additional inputs from adjacent land uses. The total score is added together to determine the wetland category. 
once the category has been determined by adding up those scores, the habitat score is what's used to determine the buffer size. Um, under our current code, we don't consider adjacent land uses for buffer sizes. Um, so with the proposed changes, um, the buffer sizes will be variable depending on the proposed land use and the land use that's adjacent to it. Um, and that's low, moderate, and high. And I, I'll get into a little bit of what each is. So a low um, intensity of impact is more of like passive recreation, unpaid trails for hiking, bird watching, preservation for natural resources, and, and forestry. Moderate um, is a little bit more of an impact. It's open space with paved trails, playgrounds, utility corridors that are shared by multiple utilities. And high is going to be the most prevalent throughout the city. So that's going to be your urban development, commercial, residential development that's greater than one unit per acre. So in the the column here, you can see these are our current wetland buffer widths. And just based on habitat score and don't take into account the intensity of impact. Um, some of these buffers are going to increase, some of them pretty substantially, um, once you factor in the adjacent land uses. And um, as I was saying before, high is going to be the most prevalent throughout the city. So it will follow this high intensity impact column here. Um, this is a slide that I had shown um, last summer during a PPC meeting. Um, this is a recent development in Issaquah. This is the Reba site. Um, so it can kind of show you what the current buffers are, the allowances that they were they used with the buffer reduction, and then what the current buffer would be under the proposed code. Um, so this is a category two wetland and it had a buffer size of 75 feet and that's the dashed line right along here. Um, they went through the buffer reduction criteria in our current code um, and were able to reduce that standard buffer by 25% to 56.25 feet, which is the green area along here. Under our current code or under our proposed code, this particular wetland with a ha with its habitat score would increase from 75 feet to 100 feet. Um, and that 100 feet is represented by the brown that kind of goes into some of these buildings here. Now, under the, the proposed code, there is no opportunity for buffer reduction, which they were able to take advantage of um, in the in the when they were developing. However, we are still allowing buffer averaging which will allow some flexibility on, on development sites. So you, where you would be able to reduce the buffer area by 25% in some areas by adding an additional 25% on site somewhere else. Um, with the, the wetland code changes, we, we, we did make some additional changes. Um, the first one being we've eliminated the density credit calculations. Um, this allowed development to take some of the development potential of a site from the critical areas to the developable site area. This allowed for an increase in um, density in the developable site area along the critical area buffer boundary. Um, this, this was only allowed for residential development and it was seldom used. Um, there is some ambiguity around stormwater facilities in our current code. Um, our code allowed for vaults and other structures if it if it you could plant native vegetation on top. Um, however, the type of vegetation to increase the habitat function um, is not allowed to be placed on a vault or it makes it difficult to be placed on a vault. Um, thereby decreasing the habitat value of that particular section of of the buffer. So we've just eliminated that, but we do allow for certain low impact development um, stormwater facilities. So rain gardens, the vegetative flow path, but not the actual dispersion trench 
Um, but vaults, bubble up structures, and flow spreaders will not be allowed within a wetland buffer. They'd have to be um, outside of the buffer. And then we created a vegetative enhancement criteria. Um, so under our current code, vegetative enhancement of the buffer was really used when you reduced your buffer. Since we've eliminated that, we now have criteria for enhancements if the if the buffer is of low quality. So if it's covered at least with 50% invasive species, um, it'll have to be enhanced. Um, or if the tree coverage is less than 25% and the slopes are less than 25%, then we'll, you'll have to do vegetative enhancement there as well. And with that, that's the end of wetlands. Take your questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Planner Duelist. And so let's go ahead and open up for uh, commissioner questions. Looks like the first question I have is from Commissioner Fisher. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. This is Cameron Fisher, Environmental Board. Uh, Doug, um, how did you um, come to the revised um, buffer sizes um, from the, the low through high? We used um, the publication from Ecology the, for the uh, 2014 wetland guidance. Um, so that that's what we use for the criteria for um, the our new buffers. And with that, they have um, used best available science in order to develop that. So we're just taking what Ecology has published for municipalities to use. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Commissioner Fisher. And the next uh, commissioner is uh, Commissioner Davidson. You have the floor. Thank you. I have a question for you about redeveloping sites. Let's pretend the Riva Creek is on a brand new, isn't it Riva Creek, correct? What's that? Riva Creek, is that the correct name of that one that you showed on the slide? I, I, that's uh, Riva Townhomes. Um, the and, creek next to it is Annie to, Aircraft. And then there's a category two wetland that's behind it. Well, let's pretend that that's an old structure and they came in for redevelopment. I'm just throwing that out there. So what would happen? They would say to us that I'm already impacting that wetland. Are we going to allow that impact to continue or would we require them to pull back and be out of that wetland when they come in to redevelop? We have, currently we have code for non-conforming uh, structures within wetland and stream buffers. Um, you're allowed to maintain and fix up that home however you want. You're allowed to expand it, though there's some expansion criteria that you'd have to follow. So you can't expand outward into the wetland buffer unless it's over existing impervious. It doesn't go closer to the wetland. You can always add a second story with no expansion outward. That would be allowed or to just expand outside of the wetland buffer if you're, say, along the, the buffer margin. Um, so there, there are ways for you to be able to, you know, work on, fix, expand your your structure that's within a wetland buffer in our current code. And is that something that we can address in this code update? I'm just asking the question because we're trying to protect our wetlands. And that's kind of what I'm concerned about is as we're going to see redevelopment in the, particularly in the valley floor. That's yeah. kind of what's being planned. And it seems to me we have an opportunity now, maybe even to do something to benefit the property owner to get them out of the wetland and repair it, maybe let them get something else somewhere else so that we're really protecting the habitat we're trying to. Is there any way we can include the, that in this code update so we don't continue to see this problem? Yeah, I'll let Minnie um, talk about that um, after I just say that will be in a in a future topic for non-conforming development. I don't exactly know which bucket it is, so that's why I'm calling on Minnie. So maybe she knows when that would be presented to um, or start going through the public process. Sure. Um, so the non-conforming chapter has a section on critical areas code and what grandfathered rights are, you know, people have property. So we're absolutely can take comments on that now. Uh, we will be taking a deeper dive in the process and procedures section. So non-conforming situations occur not necessarily only for wetlands or only for, you know, when you have critical areas. So it's more 
encompassing a chapter, uh, but if environmental board has some policy direction of uh, towards critical areas and redevelopment, you know, we can factor that in absolutely. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And thank you, Commissioner uh, Davidson and uh, Commissioner Lewis. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall. Thank you for the presentation, Doug. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, some of them are little, some of them are big, so uh, feel free to address them as you want. But I'm going to start on page 66 um, and point C2. It talks about active um, activities generating noise, and I'm curious why there's no decibel level that's set to determine what's an appropriate amount of noise. You said page 66. Uh, that's what I have. It's point at C2. It's active. Um, it's activities generating noise. So I'm curious why the choice to not be more prescriptive about what is more noise. I can give a, a personal example that um, I live in a quiet area because I have a little bit of space and we made the decision to uh, we don't aren't connected with city services. So we made the decision to go uh, away from propane use and we uh, put in some heat pumps to be able to be um, more efficient and to also be uh, more environmentally friendly but they do create some noise and we specifically went with ones that were going to be the quietest we could get on the market which weren't necessarily the cheapest ones right and i already think that they make a lot of noise i think there's a lot of activities that we do that generate noise that disturb nature when mm -hmm. we talk about the buffers that we have i'm curious why we didn't do a more prescriptive choice of setting a decibel level the same way that we do with lumens with light and other things um i don't know if i have a, yeah. have an answer yeah. for that like i know that we do that with with light and that's something that that we may be able to to look into with this okay yeah i mean the noise um you know regulations in in the city are adopting the department of ecology's noise standard so we have a separate chapter that is only about noise and that gets into the decibel levels, but the city doesn't have its own special decibel levels. We've sort of adopted what the state regulations are on noise um, by reference um, under the state law. So this code update wasn't focused, you know, we are taking a deeper dive into the noise regulations, but this particular instance over here um, was then we can look into what what this needs to be, but but the decibel levels usually are for if you're next to a residential use or you're next to a commercial use, then and what the nighttime hours are, and those go down, but not necessarily uh, decibel level. the The issue then becomes enforcement too, um, and there are exemptions that you know, like a vehicle driving by is exempt or something, things like that. So this is more qualitative then quantitative, I think, uh, regulation in, in place, but we can look look further into it. I certainly think for our wetlands and critical areas, we need to look at seeing what we want to set that at. And if, uh, if the current standard that we would have it at a different location in the city is acceptable, uh, and that should be, I think, should be looked at. Um, I'm curious, it mentions toxic runoff in point C3 being directed away from the wetlands. Mm -hmm. That's a nice touch. I, I'm sorry, we're allowing toxic waste to be diverted elsewhere. Like it's not going to make an impact on the adjacent area 100 feet away. I was a little unclear about that language. Um, can you can you point to the page? It's or page 66.C3. It's about toxic runoff is supposed to be directed away from the wetland. I think that's a, again a nice a nice start, but I have some concerns about toxic runoff. As we know, runoff doesn't tend to go where we want it to go. Yeah, maybe that maybe that point might need a little more refining. I think um, uh, I'll move on to point C four with um, the treatment um, for uh, the treatment on site of stormwater runoff. I'm curious how many sites in the public and private spheres currently have the capacity to do this treating stormwater runoff. And so could you repeat that again? I was I was trying to look for. Sorry. Actually. Yeah, on C4, we talk about um, the treatment of uh, being able to discharge right into the mm -hmm. wetland. Um, so we talk about the treatment on site of stormwater runoff. How many in the, the public and private spheres? How many um, really have the current capacity to be able to do this? How common is this to be able to treat on site? Well, I wish we had our stormwater engineer here because <laughs> where's Gary when you need him I'm curious how feasible this is right yeah. obviously this isn't happening in residential areas um 
obviously it's highly needed in, you know, for instance, in places like our fire department, right? You know, how how much of a capacity is there to be able to be creating this? Yeah. Um, or is it better to have the code be like, there is no discharge, there yeah. isn't an option, right? And that's where we start going into a director variance of someone submitting a permit saying, hey, I'm treating it on site, I need a variance, you know. I know in a lot of de developments you can treat on site. You have stormwater faults, they have filter cartridges that can take out many different types of pollutants before it goes into you know the the city system and or if you're mm -hmm. going to be using some sort of of flow path um that'll have the pollutants taken out before then um i don't I know can, i'm just not sure if we that. are doing it what's that i'm i know we can i'm just not sure if we are doing it right how i'm curious if we even are doing it and therefore the code might need to be rewritten for what actually is happening mm -hmm. um it was one of my concerns. Um, I'll move on to page 67, C5. I'm disturbed uh, by the comments about um, the chemical use. Uh, I think the penetration of 150 feet, I'd love to hear you guys speak to kind of why that um, amount was reached um, for the use of pesticides, insecticides that we know can be so very harmful. I was hoping with this update, we were gonna see a more aggressive approach from the city. Uh, 150 feet doesn't seem to be in line with the values that we I think we're hoping for going into this document. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about why the 150 feet, especially when you can see in high industrial areas, I think the buffer is 190. So you can feasibly use chemicals closer than we would allow there to be, you know, for instance, a parking lot. Yeah. And with the 150 feet, that's I, I think that's just typically and that, that's standard. And um yeah, I mean you're you're absolutely correct. I mean we have buffer sizes that exceed 150 feet and then theoretically you could be using certain pesticides and fertilizers within that within the wetland buffer so um i don't have i don't have the look where that number came from other than that that's just standard so yeah i think, I think a lot of best uh, available science yeah. shows that you know within 100 feet your pollutants can be removed yeah. before it gets to um, the bo body of water. So a lot of best available science is related to how how much room, you know, how much linear feet do you need before the pollutants actually, you know, get eliminated before they get to the body of water. And that's where that, you know, it's, it's actually 100 feet is, is shown to be the, the, the amount that is needed to create the pollutant. So it's above and beyond the, the 100 feet. Um, I've, I've seen conflicting information to that point. So I guess what I would encourage staff is to make sure that we're actually looking at which points are best available science versus what are cut and pasted from maybe stand, more standard regulations that the state uses. Um, and it's kind of that question that we talk about of where do we want to go above and beyond? I thought that the 150 feet is something that we should take a deeper dive into. Yeah, I mean, it's all, I mean, the issue with these things usually becomes enforcement. You know, we can put, not allowed anywhere, but but realistically, how how realistic does it become an enforcement of a regulation? Um, it would be very realistic yeah. if we think it's a yeah. priority in this community. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And it's actually being done in a lot of places in the country where they're um, completely banning the use of insecticides uh, because of the harm that it does on pollinators. So okay. that is happening actively right now in our country. So I think that is something that the city could take a, a firmer stand on. Um, sure. I'm, I'm kind of curious when we start to get into um, sections that need to still be created. Um, you know, I thought we were talking about, and this is specifically in reference to the in lieu of bank. Um, I thought we had kind of talked a lot in the last year about really eliminating the availability of an in lieu of bank. We had talked a lot about basically saying that, you know, a, a possible loss is actually a loss that there, even though um, an in lieu of can kind of go in the general area, uh, that it was something we were gonna be moving away from. And so I, I realized that this section is still trying to be created, but I was a little confused as to why we were still having an in lieu of bank as being an, an available option. The, the comes when when you have to get state and federal permit permits. So if you if there is no way to avoid a wetland impact, it needs to be mitigated somehow. Under our current code, you can mitigate on site, mitigate off site, then there was the the bank is the final option. Um, 
Army Corps of Engineers really are not entertaining the idea of permitting responsible wetland mitigation anymore. Their first priority is wetland bank. If there's a wetland bank within your watershed, that's that's where you go first, unless you can't do that. And there's you have to demonstrate why you couldn't purchase wetland credits at a wetland bank. Um, so now our code is just more reflecting on when there are unavoidable impacts, how do we mitigate that? Because our code was kind of the inverse of Army Corps of Engineers. And if you don't get your federal water quality certification or your your federal permits and your water quality certification from the state, then you can, there is no project. So this is to allow that to still occur and have mitigation where, you know, we're exploring and trying to figure out, well, how do we get at least some on site? And I think that's going to be working with applicants um, when there are unavoidable impacts to have at least some mitigation on site, but the regulatory mitigation will probably occur off site at a wetland bank. Okay, um, thank you. That that's helpful for kind of clarifying where we've been in the last year. Um, you know that table on page sixty eight for wetland mitigation ratios. I was hoping you could walk me through that a little bit better. Um, you know, on I think it's like QE one. It talks about changes in the water. So hydrology. Um, we know that they're actively happening, and I was kind of curious if we kind of created a loophole and almost that the wording needed to be flipped, almost assuming that there are changes happening versus needing to demonstrate um that and so i was just wondering if maybe i was kind of misunderstanding the ratios and was hoping you can kind of walk us through that table yeah so the the ratios this is for when you have direct wetland impacts so this doesn't have anything to do with with buffers um, right in, when you're doing like if if you are if the mitigation you have to create or establish a new wetland there are certain mitigation ratios so if you if you impacted one acre and you needed to create another wetland somewhere else, then you'd have to purchase it, it in the case of a bank four acres, or if you're doing the mitigation yourself, you would have to do four acres for every one. Um, and then rehabilitation is like if you're altering some of the functions of the wetland, but not directly filling in the wetland. Um, there are certain ratios for that as well. And then it's all based on what your wetland category is um, will determine and and the, the types of impacts will determine what your ratio is. And some of them are large, some of them are smaller if there isn't that much of an impact or it's a wetland that doesn't have that much like that high of a quality. OK, um, and is this just being pulled over from our previous code, or is this something that's being updated in this code? This ra these ratio tables. Um, I think this is this is something that is um, pulled over, but I'm not not 100% certain without seeing the the comparison on this one. Okay, this is a this is a good example of places where um, without a comparison, it's hard to know. Are we um exceeding are we maintaining are we just updating with what the state has um is a good clarification i think really my last point is um it's, is on, it's um, I, I, yeah. can I, i'm sorry to interrupt you it's increasing Please. a lot of them are okay. increasing so i just pulled up the table from our our code and just doing a quick glance at it well oh no i just screwed it up i think some of them are increasing but again, I, I think a side by side comparison for this might be helpful. Yeah. It could be something that's uh, good for. A clarifying point, maybe offline to be able to kind of, yes. to kind of dive into. Mm -hmm. um, I think my last question about wetlands is on page 71, uh, 5C, uh, and it's about um, the duration of the monitoring period. Uh, mm -hmm. It talks about, and I'm curious uh, what that is. The, the duration of the monitoring period, so when there are impacts to either the buffer or the wetland itself, there's a monitoring period just to ensure that the mitigation that has been done is done correctly and functions as it's supposed to in its mitigation plan. 
Um, for buffer mitigations, it's typically five years. And for direct impacts, it's 10 years. So the applicant will have to submit to the city every single year a monitoring report that is based on the original mitigation report that was approved by the city. So we'll look at how the vegetation is growing. Is it meeting the standards that were set in that mitigation plan? And then at the end of five years or 10 years in the case of a direct impact, um, there is a bond that was paid to the city prior to, then that bond would get released to the applicants and then they're done with their response, at least their, their maintenance and monitoring responsibilities during that time frame. And is that a carryover from our previous code or is this, um, do those monitoring timeframes change or the is that based again on state? Yeah, the, the monitoring times are the same. It's, it's, five years for critical areas and it's 10 years for any direct impacts. And that's that's because Army Corps and Department of Ecology require 10 years if it's a direct impact. Thank you very much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. All right, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. And uh, next person is Commissioner Finch. You have the floor. Thanks, Chair Paul. Um, Jamie Finch, Environmental Board. Um, I was curious, how does the presence of invasive species and trash and like other kind of damages to a wetland, how does that impact the, the wetland or the habitat score? Is that, well, first of all, I guess, is that the primary place that it would impact it? And then two, can you help me understand how those items might impact um, a habitat score? Yeah, the habitat isn't necessarily looking at inputs such as, as trash or invasive species is looked at and um when you're when you're filling out the wetland rating for, rating form for habitat you're you're going to the you're going to go and analyze the the plants that are on site if they're invasive you're going to mark them down there is a spot for the the number of species that you see you you know it's it's kind of a, a check the box and then add the score kind of thing um, but then you look further beyond the wetland itself to determine habitat. So then you start looking at one kilometer out and start picking out all of the potential habitat that that's within that. Is it connected? And then that further adds to the score. So you're, yeah. you, you, you look, you look tight into the wetland in the beginning, and then you kind of broaden out after that. And then you look for all of the different connections. Are there habitat corridors identified? Um, how much of the one kilometer is actual habitat? What type of habitat is it? Moderate impact, low impact, um, and then it's all scored based on that. Okay, thank you. And then, if the the presence of of heavy invasive cover, say blackberries, how significant of an impact would that be on a habitat score if that's contained to the site itself, not necessarily looking out at the broader? Um, for the overall habitat score, it would be it would be pretty minor. Um, it's it's not going to be as significant as um, when when you look at everything else. But I mean, it it is impacting the the habitat of of the at least the critical area at that at that site right there. It is okay. it is a decrease in habitat. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, on page forty three of our packet, I don't know if. The numbering for PPC and I think the numberings are a little different. <laughs> and this is, uh, yeah, I figured that might be the case. Um, so it's 43 in the environmental board and it's section F. It's related to, I think, um, plantings in the, I think it's plantings in the buffer. Mm -hmm. um, it mentions that non native plants can be used in the buffer if they serve the same function. I think all other areas that I, in, in different parts of, the code that we read through, it seemed to require native species. I'm just curious why that particular place was chosen for non-natives that serve the same function. That's the only place I could find in this language that addressed yeah. that. All right, and thank you, Commissioner Finch. And oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not done. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You looked like you're done. No, I was waiting to respond on that one. Yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to find that in here and I am struggling with trying to find or finding that particular section here. 
Do you have a section number by yeah. any chance? And we, we have the PPC packet open in the pages for that one, and I think the page numbering. So yeah. it is F, uh, section F of, and I'm not quite, it's right before additional development standards for wetland buffers, which is 18802.230. It's right yeah. before that. And it's actually section E before that. I... Another, it's right under Boggs was added in response to public comment. Okay, I found it. One update. It is E and F both of that. Yeah. That's why I originally called it F. I think that was the one I was actually referring to. Sorry. Yeah. F is, F is for when that that was the that has the criteria for when a a wetland buffer would have to be enhanced on based on development. And that's where it's 50% of the buffer area is covered in non-invasive species or non-native or invasive species or tree canopy is less than 25% and the slopes of the site are less than 25%. But why? Yeah, I, the only thing I can think of on that is probably a situation where you have a street trees, you know, it's yeah. in pre existing road that happens to be in a in a wetland wetland buffer nearby. Uh, but it may may not be um, appropriate in th that kind of an environment to have a particular species. So there's just giving some more Flexibility for for that those kind of uses. Okay. I, when I read this, I, I read something different. Like an applicant planning changes to land use that will increase impacts to wetland or buffer area must rehabilitate the buffer with native plant communities that are appropriate for the eco region region or with a plant community that provides similar functions and removes the disturbance activity. That seems like something different. So I, that's just an area we don't need to. Sure. Go that's just an area that seems. I'm I'm concerned with that section. Okay. Um, and I was just curious if there was any uh, more reasons for that. Um, one question. This was related to Commissioner Lewis's questioning around monitoring. Say someone was to go and they they impacted a buffer. They had five year monitoring period. Year five and a day, they go and cut down all of the, their plantings and put down grass. What what happens in that situation? that becomes a, a code enforcement issue and when that's discovered code enforcement is brought in and then they will bring somebody from our department to work with the applicant to get that site back again and it will have to go through that same process all over again and then a related note what is the level of staffing or at like proactive monitoring currently within the the city for those types of infringements for like the like the code kind of the code case that you were talking about or just in general the monitoring that we do throughout the city i mean i'm that being as like that being probably a prime example of the type of impact that of type of monitoring that i'd be interested in hearing yeah about. i'm sure there's plenty of other monitoring but we have one code enforcement officer and then we have you know uh, eyes and ears on the ground which are inspectors and, and the residents that, that bring up situations like that i couldn't speak to the frequency that occurs that we don't catch but i would say that most critical area violations are are brought to our attention at some point thank you that's all my questions
Thank you, Commissioner Finch. And just as a reminder that uh, we need to be asking questions as opposed to deliberation. Um, Jamie, you did a great job. Some of the other commissioners though, we're starting to deliberate and we are actually, it's 817, we have three more topics or two more topics to go through. So uh, we are getting short on time here. Uh, so the next commissioner here, uh, Don McWilliams, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall. Hopefully mine is quick. Um, going back to your, your comment you made about no hard structures built in the buffer area, so vaults in, in what you're talking about there, vaults, tanks, et cetera. Um, certainly LID is preferable, but if the developer cannot meet LID uh, means to treat their stormwater, would you allow a treatment train vault system in the buffer to protect water quality? They would the the vault would have to be contained within the developable site area outside of the buffer. Answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner McWilliams. And I have not seen any additional uh, questions here, so let's go ahead and open this up for uh, public comment. Uh, Stephen, do we have any? Uh, members of the public that would like to speak on this topic tonight. Yes, I see a few raised hands. Some might be carryover from the previous public comment, so I'm going to check with them. Okay, and just a reminder that we need to keep uh, public comment to less than five minutes tonight. Thank you. Hi, Susan, you had your hand up. Did you want to speak for public comment? Um, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Connie, did you want to speak for public comment tonight? Yep. Okay, I'm a movie to panelists now. Hey, you disabled my video again, though. Okay, there we go. So, hi, this is Connie again. You all have gotten a lot of stuff from me, so I'm uh, feeding back on you. We have something called the integrated test management, which is in a different chapter that we don't know if it's going to be updated. And that is something that um, is mentioned in, I believe, both the stream and the wetland uh, situation. So uh, that is the place where the, the pesticides and herbicides are mainly ruled. Um, then, one super general comment. I, I think the format that the code is in right now makes it very hard to find anything where under one topic, it's sort of splintered into four different areas for each topic. I think they do better all clustered together. I've watched staff fight trying to figure out where anything is on all topics. So I suggest putting it all in one place per topic. Um, the wetland chapter, is an interesting mishmash of old code and new code. And it's it's filled with inconsistencies and duplications and is unclear on the difference between wetland and wetland buffer. So I would ask for a, a big fat edit grooming because the more language you have, the more conflict you have and the more you, you can't hold people to the rules that you're trying to apply. Um, the, uh, it should always be 10 years for maintenance and monitoring in a situation like ours where light is, is our, our friend and our enemy. We cannot keep our weeds under control in five years and, uh, barely in 10. So you have no hope of having a wetland buffer, uh, actually be, uh, self-sufficient in five years. And uh, we basically don't have anybody looking at whether our wetlands have thrived over time. We have no statistics on that at all. And I watched them just go down. Even the city itself creates wetlands, supposedly, and then they just disappear over time. So one of the ways to help solve that, uh, at least for private property, is you say what they said, which is these must be maintained in perpetuity 
but then you also, like the city of Bellevue does, you say that the city has enforcement power over this and access to look at these critical areas so that they actually do have the tools to enforce. Because we constantly have the problem of the city says, we can't do that, that's not ours. And so our wetlands have degraded in incredibly over time. And it's so sad, it breaks my heart over and over again. Um, I had one more note. Um, oh, yes, we need to have our own mitigation bank. If we are going to be required by um, Army Corps to ha have a mitigated mi mitigation bank, then we need to establish our own mitigation banks so that we can keep our wetland uh, restorations in our city. And you'll notice in all of this, they never talk about actually improving the wetlands themselves. We need to improve the wetlands, not just the buffers, because that's the way you actually keep a decent wetland system. If you're just improving the buffers on the lousy wetland, you're not getting anything. So that's a total blank in this code. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Connie. Uh, Chair Fall, there is no other hands raised for public comment at this time. All right, and thank you very much, uh, Steve, uh, Planner Stephen. So, with that, we are going to go ahead and, and uh, turn this over to Nancy Davidson to go ahead and continue the environmental board deliberation. So, PPC, we let's turn off our cameras and give them an opportunity. Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Chair Fall. So now we are, are there any comments from the environmental board on the wetlands portion of the critical areas ordinance? Uh, Jamie, please go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Jamie Finch, environmental board. Uh, a couple of topics I wanted to cover. One, I do think we should be really careful about changes to habitat scores due to what I, what in some cases could be mismanagement of that wetland. I think we need to be really avoid incentivizing uh, having wetlands go the wrong way. So I don't know what the right way is to that, but that's something that I do want to make sure we, we don't encourage uh, wetlands degrading and buffers degrading. Um, two, I would echo Connie's comments related to monitoring requirements. I really think as we think about um, one of the, the key tenants for this, uh, this part of the code is to ensure that um, these these things don't degrade over time. And I just think without an aggressive monitoring approach, um, as well as the right to monitor, uh, even after the initial monitoring period, I think we're kidding ourselves that these are going to last. And so I, I really would encourage the city to not only within Title 18, but also within our operating plan and budget to look at ways that we could be encouraging um, monitoring and enforcement of these actions in particular. And then the last thing um, that I will mention, um, what was the last thing I was going to mention? Um, maybe it'll come back to me, but uh, that, that, those are the main two items that, uh, that I can recall right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, next we have up, we have Cameron Fisher. Cameron, please go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Cameron Fisher here. Um, uh, two two points. Um, it's uh, good to see the city going towards the ecology uh, rating system and uh, guidance. It's uh, basically uh, puts them into a very uh, similar situation to all the other municipalities in the uh, in the region. So uh, standardizing that. It um, listening to to Jamie Finch's comments there. Uh, the ratings. Uh, from from my experience as a as a wetland delineator, it uh, um, it's more on the conservative side versus the the um, the, the liberal side. So uh, it, it does protect those wetlands and elevates potentially elevates those wetlands to a higher category in some cases. Uh, so uh, uh, that that can provide provide a little bit more um, 
uh, protection to those those wetlands. Uh, se second point or uh, second comment I had is uh, I would encourage a, a maintenance as well as monitoring. Uh, the, the period system is, is sufficient, I think, five years, 10 years, um, but uh, a maintenance, you know, regular watering, for example, during the summer su seasons, um, a re a reduction of invasive plants is plants that come into uh, a res restored area or an enhanced area should be also uh, a requirement in there as well. So uh, thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, Tom Anderson, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Tom Anderson here. Um, so we're talking about wetlands and the buffers and the, their health as it affects the uh, local thing, uh, conditions in Issaquah. And so banking uh, with uh, wetlands far away, I mean, that just seems counter, counter to the underlying principle that we're trying to go for. So this ties in with uh, Connie March's earlier comments about if we're going to do banking, well, then it should be banked against uh, a wetland in our neighborhood, in our vicinity. Uh, if not in the city limits, well, something really close. Um, I, I didn't see anything in there about that. I, I, I really think keeping things local is um, an important principle uh, to keep in mind, um, uh, especially for ecological things. Uh, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Jamie Finch again. Go ahead. Thanks, Nancy. This was the one that I forgot. Um, I would just encourage the city to look at uh, the line of questioning that Nancy had earlier, which was how to how to encourage people to move out out of buffers and basically uh, encourage the with redevelopment how we can improve um, the location of structures and whatnot. That just seems like a, a huge opportunity for us. Um, similarly, uh, ways to incentivize people to improve the buffers and improve the wetlands themselves. I think those are just areas that I know there's not easy answers to those, but uh, it would be great if there there were uh, more ideas on on how that could be done. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And Jamie just stole my thunder, so I don't have a lot more comments to make above and beyond that. But I would encourage you to really think about trying to get the same buffer widths on existing developments if you can, if there's a way to incentivize it. So with that, that concludes the Environmental Board's comments on the wetlands areas, and I will now turn it back to Chair Fall to go ahead and move us on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Davidson. And Chair Davidson, Paul. you actually had one more comment left. I did, and I'm sorry, I don't see it. So um, did somebody else have a comment? Raise your um, hand. Board, mem board Member Anderson. Uh, I'll withdraw. Oh, I'm in sorry. Of time. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. And so now we'll go ahead and uh, move over to uh, the, the third topic. And uh, Doulis, are you uh, going to be presenting on the third topic? Yeah. Fish and wildlife um, habitat. All right. But this, is yours. this one is streams. Unless you want me to do fish and wildlife right now and go back to streams, but I have streams next on my presentation. Uh, let's see. So I had geological hazards. I had wetlands. I had fish and wildlife, and then I had critical aquifer, which were the four topics I have. Okay. Um, streams are included in the fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas, so I kind of separate them out. I I can condense them into one presentation and then do deliberations and comments afterwards or comments and deliberations. Great. Okay. Perfect. All right, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right, so with this one, I'm going to combine the two. They're, they're combined in, in the proposed code. Um, streams are a section in the fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas, but pull apart streams because they have specific buffer requirements and in certain development standards that are outside of the fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. So um, I will I'll get into more on on the fish and wildlife because that is an entirely new section. Um, so for streams, um, the this is included in the fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. The goals we pulled from 
uh, the comp plan and the strategic plan um, specifically to conserve and protect environmental critical areas from loss and degradation and enhance wetland and riparian corridors in the cities, lakes, creeks, and streams to improve environmental function. Um, so the major changes, similar to wetlands, we eliminated the 25% buffer reduction for streams. Um, we've incorporated uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife stream classification. So in our in our current code, we have a different classification system than WDFW. And we're right now we're just going to match the two to make it just for for ease. Um, we define fish use and expand stream protections to streams that have potential for, for fish use. So often there might be a, a fish blockage downstream. Um, upstream would be habitat, but it's blocked. That will now be protected as fish habitat and, and be considered a fish bearing stream. Um, and then we've also expanded our definition of stream to capture fish use um, if there is a, a connection, a downstream connection to waters of the states, um, and then offer the same protections for those as as streams. So if if a if a water course that is not um, a stream has the presence of fish, then it will be considered a fish bearing stream. Um, so here is a chart of our current stream classification and our proposed classification. So currently we use class one. We have two different types of class two, um, class two with salmonids, class two that's without salmonids, but it still may contain fish species a class three and a class four. Class four are channelized streams. So these were historic streams that were straight and narrowed and, um, um, and altered in, in some fashion, but they're still streams. Um, with the class two, it, with the two different types of class two, um, we've now combined them to just be uh, type F, so fish. So now we just capture all fish. Class one are type S, which are shorelines of the state. So these are uh, streams large enough to fall under shoreline jurisdiction and governed by the shoreline master program. Um, in, in Issaquah, that's uh, East Fork, Issaquah Creek, and Issaquah Creek. Class three will now be um, non fish bearing seasonal streams and then class four will be captured as a non fish bearing seasonal stream type NS. Um, and the buffer sizes for those um, are, are remaining the same. The, the only difference is the class two that may have contained fish, but not salmonids will increase from 75 to 100 feet. Um, Similar to the wetlands, we've eliminated the density credit calculations. Um, you know, as described before, this allowed development to take the development potential of the critical area and transfer it to the developable site area. Um, and again, same with wetlands, uh, kind of um, eliminated stormwater structures from within stream buffers, um, still allowing certain low impact development, um, but any any vaults, bubble up structures, flow spreaders, those aren't allowed within the wetland. And another change we made is that um, we've included a section regarding culvert replacement. So if a new or redevelopment impacts a culvert, it may have to be replaced to allow fish passage if it's determined there is potential fish habitat upstream from the culvert. And I'm just going to skip over this and go right into the fish and wildlife habitat. Um, so this is an entirely new section. Um, the Growth Management Act has us um, to offer protection for a variety of, of different habitat and plant species. Um, so this offers protections for wetlands, streams, natural areas, and habitat for plants and animals. So what, what counts as a fish and wildlife habitat conservation area um, if the site has federally or state listed endangered threatened and sensitive species all waters of the state so this this will capture streams um, rivers lakes ponds um, 
biodiversity and habitat corridors. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has mapped um, these wildlife and habitat corridors. If a, if these corridors are present on site, further protections will need to be made to ensure that that corridor remains. Um, may have to alter their plans to protect a particular area on site or offer some further protections for the continued use of the corridor. And then also, also natural areas, um, Lake Sammamish State Park, Squawk and Tiger Mountains, um, those are all considered fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. So we have a few tools to, to figure out where these are located. So this slide shows a uh, priori priority habitat and species interactive map that WDFW um, has on their website. It's an interactive map. It's got parcels. Um, the colors represent habitats or particular species listed for protection. When you click on a particular property, it will generate a report similar to the one that's on the, the right side of the screen. And everything that's known to be on site will be on there. If a project falls into an area, further analysis will be required with the critical area area report and mitigation of that particular habitat or protection of that species will need to be demonstrated in the report, which will be third party peer reviewed. And then that concludes streams and fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. All right, and thank you very much, uh, Planner Duels. So let's go ahead and we'll open it up for uh, commissioner questions. And again, please remember questions, not deliberations. And uh, so if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in your in the chat window. And Planner Duelist, I have a question for you. Do you go by Doug or Duelist? It, I miss, <laughs> it's Douglas. It's Douglas. So it, okay. it's just a misspelling. I typed fast and I wasn't able to rename it. Steven's not able to re rename me. So, but it, it it is Doug or Douglas. So Steven just pinged me. He says, it's not Duelist, it's Doug. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a lot easier to pronounce. <laughs> okay, so the first commissioner here is uh, Commissioner Lewis, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall. Uh, Doug, on page 75, that table about the stream buffer widths, um, can you help me understand uh, why we kept so many of the numbers the same? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna actually defer to you Mini, if that's okay with you. Please, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think with this update, um, we've focused on aligning it with the categories that the Fish and Wildlife has, updating the um, the definition. So, br uh, you know, bringing that in alignment and then obviously the, the lowest uh, buffer of 25 feet, we've eliminated that. We've made some buffer widths from 75 to 100 feet. Um, we have a shoreline um, master program that we, you know, Department of Ecology approved last year. You all worked on that, and you know, or, or the year before that, um, that has the shoreline uh, streams that are uh, typed as a hundred foot buffer. Um, so all of those things factored into where what we know of a, a, at this point. Um, there isn't that clear guidance from Department of Ecology on the buffer width as it is for the wetlands. Um, obviously, Ecology approves our shoreline, which two of our streams are within the shoreline jurisdiction, and they approved the hundred foot. So that's that was our thought process with with bringing this in alignment with uh, what we know um, of the different you know um, studies that are out there. There are some studies out there that have 
sort of brand new. Um, if we decide to to go down that path, we'll probably need to do more on the field assessment of what what the conditions are, what the urban environment in Issaquah is, and what those buffer widths um, you know uh, should be. If we could do a more research just on the streams, but because this is part of a Title 18 update, uh, we brought it as far along given all the information that we had uh, of the circumstances that we're, you know, bringing bringing the definition, aligning the, the types of the streams, knowing our shoreline was updated. This is what we put together as a first draft. I don't know if that answers your question. It it does. Uh, that is helpful. Um, going off of those, um, stream buffers uh, i'm curious on page 78 um, on e it talks about trails and the allowance of both public and private trails through that um through that through that buffer the language to me is very odd in that paragraph and i'm curious if you could talk to me more about how we can remove vegetation to create a trail but then that vegetation needs to be added somewhere else but if there is no space then we have to mitigate it somewhere else that paragraph in particular about trails, we didn't really get any information about. And I want, I'm hoping you guys can kind of clarify a little bit about um, being able to go through the buffer to create a trail, both public and private. Uh, so the Shoreline Management Act, uh, you know, goals of that are also recreation and water dependent uses and those kind of things. The Growth Management Act has more of a focus of protection. So I, th I think for recreation purposes and things like that, the trail section in, we, we discuss trails in three different sections. So one is in the steep slopes area, one in the wetland and one in the, in the, in the um, stream buffers. Uh, the idea there is that if there are put in, you still have to mitigate any impact that might come from from uh, putting the, the the trail within the buffer. So maybe you can help me understand then for specifically our trails through uh, with, with this section on um, the fish and wildlife habitat. Is this a part? Is this a carryover code from previous? Is this an alignment with state with state standard standards or is this new? Our previous code did allow um, uh, trails within the buffers and we've kept that here. Uh, it is aligned with the state's requirements. It does require mitigation for any impacts. Okay, thanks many. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Commissioner Lewis and Commissioner Finch, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Fall, Jamie Finch, Environmental Board. Um, I was curious, we looked at the Shoreline Master Program whenever that was a week, a few weeks ago. Are there any instances where what we have for streams or the acronym with starting with that to that would have those waters would have more protection under those portions of the code? I'm just trying to understand the or like how how those relate to each other. Yeah, the shoreline master program does have different allowances for water dependent uses. Um, You'll find more leniency along the lake in Issaquah, mostly because the shoreline master program adopts a critical areas ordinance um, as an appendix. So the stream standards that are in the critical areas ordinance kind of become the SMP. Um, but there are instances because of the way that the shoreline management act and the shoreline master programs are structured that allow for greater use along the shorelines of the state versus um, streams or wetlands. Okay, that's helpful. But in terms of like buffers and those types of things, there that's not the case. It's just potential use of those specific uses could be. Yeah, so there's for the shoreline master program, there's um, like water access is big for to allow public water access. Um, that's something that's not really discussed in the critical areas ordinance, but for the lake shore, you know, there's allowances for for paths down to the water. There's allowances for water dependent uses, and those those items aren't included in the critical areas ordinance. But the water dependent uses, at least for us, are along the lake, mostly because our streams are the the code for streams is the critical areas code and that gets adopted by ref or adopted by appendix. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I just have one more question. Um, there was mention of stream channel stabilization. Mm -hmm. Could you just, and it would reference some like 
requirements that I, I wasn't sure on where those references led to. Could you help me understand kind of what that, there's variations of what that would look like, but I'm just trying to, I'm picturing something bad and I just want to make sure I understand what that would look like. Yeah, His, historically it was pretty bad. You're, you're talking about like rip wrap um, for, for streams. So just hard armoring along the stream to prevent erosion. Um, now, though it's not discussed as much in the critical areas code, in the SMP, there's a there's a provision for biostabilization or using some form of soft shore. So it's using using a combination of of natural and um, man made elements to create a more natural shoreline to provide stabilization that way versus just throwing up rip wrap um, or a big concrete wall. And that's more of what we're we're going to be looking for when it comes to stream stabilization. Um, most of the stabilization will probably occur along Issaquah Creek, which will be governed by the SMP. And in that, that's the first biostabilization is is the is the top, unless you can unless you can demonstrate that it will not work and you need to do some form of hard structural armoring. Okay. So, but right now, if it's not is if it's not shore, shoreline of the state, we don't have specific requirements around what that would look like. Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Finch and um, Commissioner uh, Ann Newcomb. You have the floor. Oh, hey, Ann Newcomb here. Just a quick question. I noticed you had um, Tiger and Squawk, or yeah, Tiger and Squawk were in your Fish and Wildlife um, mm -hmm. Habitat corridors in Lake Sammamish, but not Cougar. Why is that? I think it's for tiger and squawk. There, there are um, state managed parks or natural areas there, and and that's why that is. But I don't know. Maybe squawk was included on that, and I just missed it. Um, but I know, like the there's like the Cougar Mountain natural area, um, so that's why though that was included. Yeah. Tiger well, I saw, I saw tiger and squawk, but not cougar. Yeah. So anyway, I bet there's some corridors on cougar too. <laughs> I bet that Thanks. there is. And if you expanded that map out, you'll see that there's, you know, and you cl start clicking around, you'll see that there's corridors um, kind of throughout. Most of them follow streams or, or small, you know, smaller water courses, but you do find um, corridors and then the connections between the two. Cool. Great. Thank you. Yep. And thank you, Commissioner Newcomb and Commissioner uh, Davidson. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And I only have I have two questions, but I did I typed in twice. I apologize. The first one is for you, Doug, in terms of the interaction of this between this and the floodway. So if mm -hmm. we look at these things, I know we got a presentation last night on uh, the floodplain and you know what plans are there. If you talk about the stream buffers, particularly like on Issaquah Creek, just to take that, if you use the buffer, are we outside. Will the buffers keep us outside the floodway? Have you ever done that kind of analysis? Not not an in depth analysis. Most of the time, yes, it keeps you out of of the floodplain. Um, there are areas along Issaquah Creek where that does not occur and that that's the south end of the city where the the 100 year floodplain extends far beyond um, the 100 foot buffer. So then you fall into the requirements of having to to you know the stream buffer requirements, but then you have the flood hazard requirements as well. And and those get looked at and you know they'll get looked at together between you know reviewers in our department and um, we have a floodplain engineer who will look at that as well for flood hazard permits, and we'll we work closely together. Okay, just trying to understand how the two interact. And I guess the other question I have for you, and it ties to both this, the um, the streams and the fish and wildlife habitat areas, and the um, and the wetlands, and that is how does groundwater interact with all this? Because if you look at several areas in the city, particularly in the valley floor where the groundwater is in the winter becomes surface water. If you look at Tibbetts uh, 
Creek Park. You can look in uh, many places in Old Town. The groundwater is right there at ground level or above. And how are we in dealing with that one along in this in the critical areas? With the stream section, I mean, it's we're, it's not looked at now. For it will be looked at when we do the storm and surface water master program. That's an opportunity to to look at it. But with this, we're just focused on the actual critical area itself and not so much on the the groundwater. Though, you know, we get into Cara, the critical area or the critical aquifer recharge area next. Um, so there may there's maybe some things with that, but in terms of the interaction between groundwater and streams, we're not really looking at the two together when it's streams. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Davidson. And uh, let's see. Okay, uh, I do want to bring up that we are running short on time. Um, it's already 8.52. We are already half hour over. So um, let's go ahead and move on to public comment. I'll, I'll go ahead and open up public comment at 8.52 for this specific topic. And uh, Stephen, do we have any um, members of the public that would like to make comment tonight? Yes, I have uh, one raised hand by Connie. I'm going to move um, unmute her now and make her a panelist. Okay, this is Connie again. So um, it's actually state law that this code update has to include best available science. And um, Department of Fish and Wildlife seems to be our basis for best available science for our stream corridors yet they are not using the best available science that's provided by Fish and Wildlife to provide the uh, buffer guidance in this situation. It is unclear to me, or I'm unable to understand sort of the pathway for when these standard codes are in effect and when you have to go do a a mitigation or management report that considers Department of Fish and Wildlife guidance. I'm also not clear, there's some language in there saying that the buffer will not be reduced to less than 100 feet on uh, buffer averaging. And so I, I don't really understand how that works, but I am very sure that they are not achieving best available science buffers for their streams. And um, so I totally disagree with that. I also think that the fish and wildlife habitat conservation area needs to be an overarching chapter because it, it contains all kinds of habitat and it does not work to have it sort of tucked into the streams chapter. It's more like the SMP where it should be overarching. And then the uh, last thing I have, no, I have two more things. The there is a thing that is called a, a species of local concern and this is a nether map feature from department of fish and wildlife and uh, we're using a biodiversity and habitat corridor uh, is are those being considered to be the same thing but using slightly different language i would like to see streams being considered riparian management zones because it's not the streams themselves it's actually the area around the streams and the buffers that uh, create the habitat that feed the fish that keep everybody going and so just to call them streams seems like um, uh, an inappropriate visual for what we're trying to do thank you very much Chair Fall, I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, very good, thank you. And so with that, I will go ahead and open up to um, the Environmental Board uh, to deliberate. 
And just remember, there is a shortage of time. We, Julie has until 9.15, so we need to get this wrapped up so she can go on to the topic before she has to leave tonight. All right, thank you, Nancy, you have the floor. Thank you, are there any comments on uh, this particular topic from the Environmental Board? Jamie, please go ahead. Thank you, Nancy, Jamie Finch, Environmental Board. I would just echo a lot of the same comments we had, or I had around buffers and hoping to get people out of the buffers of streams similar to wetlands with redevelopment um, as well as being proactive about monitoring and then the only other item i would add is what i was questioning around around stream stabilization that just seems like a potential issue that we should probably just make consistent across our waterways thank you are there any other comments from the environmental board Okay, um, I just have one small comment. I too agree with uh, Connie, which is that kind of the water areas that we're talking about in this is kind of overarching, including the shoreline master plan, the stream section, and then the fish and wildlife. And I would encourage you to really think about it in a holistic way. And it just doesn't feel like that's coming across in this code as we look at it. And we want to make sure that we're trying to do the best we can with it. That's just kind of, as I read it, that was my interpretation. Any other comments from the Environmental Board? Seeing none, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Paul. Fall. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Na uh, Davidson. So with that, uh, the last topic here is the critical aquifer and recharge areas. And uh doug looks like uh are you presenting on that one as well i am excellent okay so the floor is yours okay all right so i will i will just make this quick um, and go through here because I know we are really limited on time. So this is the update 1810-796, the CARA. So this is the critical aquifer recharge area. Um, this is what protects um, our groundwater. So um, this establishes groundwater protection standards and protects degradation and depletion caused by developments. And, and this is a, a big, this is a big area because about 50% of Issaquah's drinking water comes from groundwater and, and wells that we have in the city. Um, so the major changes are increased care classification. Um, the, um, the classification maps have been revised. Um, development triggered studies and update to prohibited and restricted uses. So the basics, rain and surface water replenish the groundwater through infiltration. And I'd already spoken about where 50% of our, our drinking water comes from. Um, and just needs needs protection, needs protection from hazardous materials and development that's within the city, hazardous toxic materials specifically. Um, and also to allow the aquifer to continue to recharge so that the water is is available in the future. So the major changes, um, the recommendations have been worked on for years between public works and their consultant to update the, the CARA. Um, their work has been captured by the Title 18 update since CARA regulations are located in our current 1810. Um, incorporate updated car maps into city code. So part of part of their work was to analyze the groundwater, how long it takes the groundwater to get from one particular area of the city to the wellhead capture area. Um, and there, I have a, a map on the next slide that will will, that will show that. Um, so there are prohibited land uses within certain certain CARAs, um, 
based on the potential for groundwater contamination. So an example would be a new fuel station within CARA-1 would, would be a prohibited use. Existing fuel stations would still be allowed to exist, but no new stations would be, be allowed. Um, and then adds references to IMC 1329. So th this allows for greater best management practices to prevent groundwater contamination. So here is a a side by side comparison. The the left is our current um, CARA map showing um, wellhead capture area and uh, zones for recharge, and then on the right is the new map based on analysis that Public Works and their consultants have been working on um, to better understand the groundwater's movements and. Um, how to protect the groundwater so the drinking water is is not contaminated. With that, questions. All right, and thank you very much, Planner Douglas. So let's go ahead and open up for questions. And the first question that I have is from uh, Commissioner Finch. You have the floor. I think Don, I actually haven't posted anything. I think Don might be the first comment on this one. Oh, okay. I have uh, Don McWilliam. So, so you're not uh, you're not going to speak then because I got you down here at 8.56. Yeah, that was for the, the prior one. Okay. That was for the prior section. Excellent. And uh, so, Commissioner McWilliams, you have the floor then. Uh, thank you, Chair Fall. Hey, Doug, can you flip back to that map real quick and just show us if you're allowed to, where the wells actually exist in Issaquah. I don't know if you can actually yes. tell us that or not. I don't know the exact location. Um, it may be, I think Julie is on here as well, can kind of point me, but I think there is, um, a well in this area here, and then another one somewhere in this area. Julie, do I have that correct? Yeah, I can't see your mouse. Um, but oh, to, I'm but to, on the screen. I'm on the wrong screen. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah generally, yeah. all of Issaquah's drinking water wells and most of Sammamish's as well are kind of along the I-90 corridor. So, in the heart of the city, in that darker blue class one classification, and that's why. That classification was assigned as well, just because of uh, ground, uh, drinking water protection for those wells. So mainly in that dark blue area. What's is there anything in the light green area that supplies drinking water to Squaw? Uh, not to the public, no. That's all I had. Thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you, uh, Commissioner McWilliams and Commissioner Lewis. You have the uh, floor. Thank you, Chair Fall, Commissioner Joy Lewis. Uh, one question on CARA is um, on point B, is the hydrologic, um, hydrogeologic study done by staff in house, or is this one that we use a consultant for? It is done by a consultant, Geosyntec. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Commissioner Lewis. And Commissioner Finch, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Paul, Jamie Finch, my on board. I was just curious, um, it seemed like we had a lot of the same timelines or designations on the, the old map and then on the new map. I'm just curious the the difference in size. What what is that just an update and how we're able to track things or speak to like why that area has gotten significantly larger since the, the, the last study was done? I can speak to that. Um, so the old study was done in about 2004, and that was really just based off of our uh, understanding of lithology at the time from soil borings. Uh, the new study that was done by our consultant was done in about 2019 and was done in like a 3D modeling world. So um, not only looking at what we know about subsurface lithology, but really mapping that more in a 3D area. And then they could drop like these hypothetical water particles into that model and see what they do as um, different wells would draw that water. 
or, and then also they reversed that. So they kind of did some, some ground truthing of that model in that, in that way. Um, so it's a combination of recharge, how easily groundwater moves through that soil, um, and how long it takes that water uh, to get to those wells in proximity to the wells. Great, super helpful, thank you. Okay, and thank you, Commissioner Finch. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions. I just wanna make sure everyone's had a chance to ask questions. Uh, PPC has been kind of quiet tonight. So uh, is there any members from PPC that would like to ask a question? Okay, I am not seeing any. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, Stephen, are there any members of the public that would like to ask questions about this topic? Yes, I see one raised hand. Connie, I'm going to unmute you now and make you a panelist. So I'm going to I'm going to tip you all over. I I this needs a little work, but not a lot of work. This is this actually is. An upgrade. Now, don't faint. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. And then I um, have one more comment from Kyler. I'm going to un unmute you now and make you a panelist. I'll be very quick. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to echo my previous comment. Um, that I hope that you read my letter and that you consider the impact that this has to the development agreement that Lakeside Industries has with the city of Issaquah because that is a contract. And um, I believe that this new change is inconsistent with that contract. Um, it's also inconsistent with the zoning. So thanks. Chair Fall, that is all the hands I see. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And so with that, I'm going to close public comment at 9.08. Uh, and uh, I'm going to hand this over to Nancy for uh, deliberations. Chair Fall, if I can make just a quick comment too. I think one of the uh, requests uh, from Kyler was to get a copy of the report. We'd be happy to set up a meeting and provide uh, additional information on that. Just wanted to to acknowledge that, that we'd be happy to provide the supporting documentation and have a conversation about the development agreement with them. Excellent, thank you for that uh, comment there. And uh, so Nancy, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, are there any comments from the environmental board on this topic? Well, I'll start it off. I really appreciate the regulations that you've provided in here. I think it is a big step forward. And I want to say I'm totally in support of what direction and the way this was written and the requirements that are identified within it. So great job. That's my comment. Any other comments? OK, seeing none, we are closed on that one. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fall for, or Chairperson Fall for letting us provide comments. All right, and thank you very much, uh, Commissioner D uh, Davidson. So with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and close out. And the next set of business here now, Kristen had mentioned we have meeting minutes to approve, except I don't have any meeting minutes in my packet. Am I the only one? Doesn't see the meeting minutes? Stephen or Kristen, can you speak to that? Yeah, give me one second to switch my screens. Uh, for tonight's meeting, there were meeting minutes for February 10th and February 24th. Okay. Beginning of the packet, Chair Fall, page five. You know what? I'm looking at a printed out copy, so oh. they're not in my copy. Oh. So, um, okay. I'm going to assume that other people have looked at it. So with that said, uh, the meeting minutes, Minnie, what are the meeting minute dates? 
The meeting minute dates were for February 10th and for February 24th. Okay, so with that said, uh, are there any changes or questions to the uh, February 10th meeting minutes? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and approve those. And are there any questions or corrections for the February 24th meeting minutes? Okay, seeing none, uh, those meeting minutes are approved as well. Okay, with that, now we'll go ahead and go over to uh, reports. Excuse me, Chair Paul. Yes. This is Nancy Davidson, the Chair of the Environmental Board. Um, at this point, I think our work is done with your committee. Do you need us to continue to participate in this meeting? No, you are more than welcome to uh, sign off if you'd like. Well, thank you for the opportunity on behalf of the board. We appreciate the opportunity to give your comments and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank good you. Night. Chair Fall, I just have a, a couple of updates for you tonight. Um, City Council met earlier this week in person for the first time. Um, there is not yet a plan for boards and commissions to be meeting in person, but that will be kind of the next discussion now that they've started to meet in person. Uh, we'll let the boards and commissions know once those discussions have happened. Uh, at that meeting, they approved the, uh, the housing, housing action plan uh, implementation grant. And so we're gonna be working um, diligently on that project. Uh, and the last thing is just our next PPC meeting is on March 24th, where uh, the commission will be deliberating on the, the entire national environment uh, topic. Minnie, did you have anything to add for updates? No, nothing uh, more to add. Thank you. Okay. Chair Fall, that's it for, uh, for staff update, updates. Excellent. All right. And with that, uh, any other business announcements? Or is that it? I think you kind of combined the reports and other business and announcements all into one category, which is fine. We just killed two birds with one stone. So with Commissioner, that, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Lewis, you put a comment on point of order. Thank you. I do have a quick point of order, and that's on the reasonable use exemptions. We never covered that uh, part of our packet tonight, and uh, I'm curious if staff will be covering it in more in depth in the next time we meet on the 24th. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're happy to provide any additional information you want on that. I think in, in our response back to community comments, we did include a handout and I think that was an email that went out to all of you. So there is some information as a response to a comment that was in your packets, but um, in your emails, but we're happy to cover that at, on the 24th if you need additional information. Certainly we've discussed um, the questions that I have about it. And so since it wasn't discussed with the environmental board, I think it would be nice in a public forum for us to be able to go over that um, sure. at, 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 our, at our meeting on the 24th. Yep. Thank you. Okay, and with that, uh, we're gonna close at uh, 914. Great, thank you everybody. Take care y'all, thank you. Have a good night.